let me get started. It says, um, this call for some mass and some radius with a small mass. Oh, I have two mass. Okay, let me call this mass of the disk and small mass. Oh, so it's going to be important that it's a disk. It's going to be important that it's a small mass. A small mass of 0 0.3 kilogram attached at the edge is edge is rotating at some value uh, revolutions per second. So that technically that's not angular velocity that is um, or angular frequency. It is just uh, frequency uh, revolutions per second. That's the revolution like radians. It's not a real unit, but when we say revolution, one full circle per second, it, we are referring to frequency. Uh, the small mass while attached to the disk slides gradually to so attached to the disk slides gradually to the center of the disk <laughs> and um, by the way if you uh, find the, the this question in OpenStax University Physics you will see that our wording is slightly different. Uh, the OpenStax University Physics actually says the small mass detaches or something and if that's the real question, then, then the answer here is pretty simple. 1.9 revolutions per second. Because um, why should the mass detaching affect the disk at all? So um, now, you know, that's a horrible uh, trick question. So my, our interpretation is that, well, the question shouldn't be that way. And we actually submitted the errata asking OpenStax people to fix it. And the way we worded this question for our class is the fixed version of the question. And it's worded in this specific way to make a particular thing hold true. Um, so instead of having the small mass detach, we are having it actually move. It's still attach it to the disk. So it's still somehow interacting with the disk. So let me give a more detailed picture of this so that I can give a better, fuller description of this physical setup. So here's the disk of radius R. And um, there's a small mass attached to it. Uh, let me draw the small mass here. And um, the, I said the small part was going to be important. I'm basically treating mass, this mass as to be so small that I can treat it like a point mass. That's really what the thing is. And uh, these are rotating together as some um, uh, frequency, f, or uh, you might be characterizing it with the angular frequency. Either is fine. Just make sure how you're doing it. And then it says, while this is rotating, this mass here, it's a sliding inward until it reaches the center where that's going to remain. So, so as you read that description, I guess, um, uh, so you have quite a few tools in your problem solving toolbox. And whenever I'm not 100% sure what tool I should use, the first tool I would go to is conservation law. So really what I'm looking for is what quantity is conserved. And if I can find the conserved quantity, then, then that's the quantity I'll use <laughs> to um, calculate, try to calculate whatever it is that I need to calculate. And um, I think as you are considering conservation law strategy, one thing that will help you are the, are the fact that you only know of three quantities that are conserved. You know of energy, momentum, angular momentum that are conserved. So what you should go through is, okay, let's think through energy, momentum, and angular momentum and go through the conditions for these things being conserved. So for energy, what you need to be able to say is no work by non-conservative force. 
And in this particular setup, I think that's a difficult thing to guarantee because it says that the small mass is sliding inward. And I don't think that that's something that would happen without some sort of uh, applied force because usually as things are rotating, it could slide outward, but sliding inward, it feels like something must be kind of applying a force to get it to move inward. So that probably involves a violation of conservation of energy. And momentum, the condition for momentum being conserved is no impulse due to external force. And I think uh, this situation kind of makes it difficult to conserve momentum. Kind of two reasons. So this force could easily be an external force. And there's probably a pivot at the center of the disk, which kind of applies whatever external force needed to keep it from moving around. So kind of go with the assumption that momentum is probably not um, the conserved quantity. So that leaves you with uh, angular momentum. And uh, if you somehow don't remember, the condition for conserving angular momentum is, is to rely on analogy between the linear motion and rotational motion. So with the momentum, the reason the external internal force distinction was important was because of Newton's third law. With the internal forces, you could uh, rely on the action reaction force having equal and opposite impulse that would cancel out. So that conserves total momentum. Um, and um, so that's why if you have external force that would now change the momentum. With the, so in the context of the linear motion, there was this uh, di um, kind of an uh, intimate relationship between force and momentum. And in fact, that was that rate of change of momentum gave you net force. In the rotational context, you're going to have the same relationship, which is that the torque, and same in the sense of there's an analogy between translational dynamics and rotational dynamics. And the analogy is this. Torque is the analogous quantity to force. The quantity that's uh, analogous to momentum is the angular momentum. And as long as you have these analogies held up, then all the other relationships you had before is uh, still true. All these other things equal to the rate of change of this quantity, they will continue to hold. So, you know, so if you don't already know what the condition is for conserving angular momentum, then you look at what the condition was for momentum and you kind of reproduce a version of that. So I guess we don't talk about rotational version of impulse. So, skipping the so all that no impulse means uh, like a, act, a force acting over a duration of time. So, uh, so I have that duration of time in mind. So really what I'm getting at is no external torque. So as this mass is sliding inward, it's going to be interacting with the disk. So there will be some kind of torque on the disk. There will be some kind of torque on the mass, but those torques are internal torques. They are connected to each other through that Newton's third law. The action reaction torque are going to be equal in magnitude. They'll cancel each other out. And this force that could be potentially external force well, the lever arm for that force relative to this pivot point, that's a zero, so that's not providing any external torque. So that's great. That one external force is not gonna be producing any torque. So 
So that after having gone through all these considerations is when you can figure out, oh, my angular momentum will be conserved. So, so now that I have a conserved quantity to work with, I can use conservation law strategy. So I've um, identified the conserved quantity. Then my quote unquote second step is to identify a useful snapshot. Here, I think the snapshot will be snapshot one where the mass is out here on the edge and snapshot two where the mass has slid to the center. Those are kind of the things that connect the things I know with the things that I don't know. So, um, so yeah, this will be F1, this will be F2. Um, so those are the snapshots. So finally, I'm going to, or my third step, I'm going to write down the conservation law equation. Here, I'm going to use conservation of the total angular momentum. Uh, by the way, for this question, the vector property doesn't really matter, so let me use that. So, all right, so what I'm saying is that the total angular momentum in snapshot one is still equal to the total angular momentum in snapshot two. And now speaking of angular momentum, there are a couple different ways to express angular momentum. It, yeah, and you know, you can kind of review that. Those expressions are uh, rotational inertia times the angular velocity. This is the version that's analogous to momentum is equal to mass times velocity. And there's uh, actually one more expression that uh, sometimes you need to know that angular momentum is give, it's connected to momentum through this displacement cross product with the momentum. Or you can think of this as lever arm times momentum. And um, these quantities are useful at different times. Well, what I would say just in the short amount of time is that this is the more fundamental expression. That's the kind of definition of angular momentum. But in a lot of situations, you would find this to be more useful. And that is the case our case here, because uh, with the disk and point mass, um, we can kind of figure out the rotation inertia relatively easily. And we are given the frequency, which is fairly easily related to the angular frequency. Uh, it's related to angular frequency by this factor of two pi. So, so let me use this expression here for angular um, momentum. So what I have is, all right, um, let me deal with the total uh, rotation inertia. So in snapshot one, I have a total rotation inertia at snapshot one times angular velocity at snapshot one is equal to total rotational inertia in snapshot two times angular velocity in snapshot two. So um, I guess I need to write down <laughs> what those rotational inertias are. Um, so let me write them down. I'm going to use the superposition principle, which I mentioned before. So according to the superposition principle, the total rotational inertia in snapshot one, that's going to be rotational inertia of the disk um, around the, you know, the center, plus the rotational inertia of the small or point mass around the same uh, axis. So for the disk, I know it's one half mass of the disk and the radius of the disk squared. For the point mass at distance r, rotational inertia will be mass of that point mass times the rotational inertia squared. So that's at snapshot one. And snapshot two, this will be slightly different. So I still have the rotation inertia of the disk that hasn't changed. What changes is um, at this, so when the point mass is here, it has zero lever arm, so it has a zero rotation inertia. So it'll just be zero. So uh, it'll just be one half mdr squared. So, all right, let me plug those in and get the expression. So my initial angular momentum is one half md r squared plus mp r squared 
times omega 1 um, is equal to rotation inertia after the mass has slid to the center, 1 half mdr squared times omega 2. So I have some things that simplify. Uh, radius just cancels out, which is great because, uh, well, that's great. I mean, even though I do have the radius, but eh, the fewer numbers I need to plug in, the better. And um, I guess with this angular frequency, you can, um, you know, imagine plugging in uh, the expression here. Then, you know, this would be 2 pi times F1 given. This will be 2 pi times F2 that we are looking for. And the thing is, you know, these two pi just cancel out. So you could just replace. But this is the proper way to do it. So, all right, let me kind of uh, simplify this here so that um, we can solve it for F2, which is what they're looking for. Um, so solving this for F2, this is what I end up with. F2 is equal to, um, I have F1 times, I think it's gonna be ratio of the masses, one half MD plus MP, one half MD plus MP, you can plug in the numbers, divided by this mass here, one half MD. And when you plug in the numbers, you know, keep this still in the units of revolutions per, per second. You should just get the same unit answer. So, yeah, so that's it. The, uh, really, the um, most uh, challenging step here is uh, working out the one, you know, kind of what strategy to apply and realizing that conservation law strategy can work and that angular momentum is conserved. Once you figure that out, then the rest is uh, relatively simple.